Hello, and welcome back to Movie Husbands. Today we're reviewing Civil War. Written and directed by Alex Garland, Civil War follows, you guessed it, a civil war. The United States has broken out into a multi-party war, and renowned and hardened fellow jurist Lee Smith joins her colleague Joel as they travel to Washington, D.C. to exclusively interview the President of the United States. Civil War stars Kirsten Dunst, Wagner Mora, Kaylee Spaney, Stephen McKinley Henderson, and Nick Offerman. So Jeffrey, what do you think about Civil War? So Civil War, I think, is actually maybe Alex Garland's best directed feature. Even while I've been relatively cool on most of his filmography, to be honest, he is improving as a director. And this film is a massive increase in scale over his prior features. But even as he's increasing his talent as a director, I do feel like he's putting less effort into his screenwriting efforts, which is very interesting because he started out as a novelist and primarily screenwriter. He didn't direct until Ex Machina, which is his first directorial film, but he also wrote films like 28 Days Later, and uh, he wrote the novel The Beach. So it's just interesting that he seems to be moving in this direction that I think that his films often are vague and lack context on purpose. Even while he's improving his directorial talent with, frankly, some fantastic imagery and a lot of interesting things that he's doing as a director in this film. There are a variety of sequences in the film that are thundering in their intensity, even as we approach the climax and the ultimate end of the film, which I'm sure we'll get into at some point. But just as with just about every Alex Garland feature, I, I get frustrated with just the utter lack of insight. Ex Machina, I think, is his talkiest feature and one of the only ones that actually explores the ideas that the film's portentous, important texture seems to have. Coming out of the theater last night, just to tell our story, we saw the movie last night. I came out like raging. You were raging. I, I, I was like, that movie was <laughs> That movie had nothing to say. It's hijacking all of these political divides and hijacking all of these important ideas just to say nothing about them at all and and, and jeopardize the country and, and all this stuff. I was really mad last night. I don't necessarily like the film better sitting right now than I did last night, but I am glad that I got to marinate on it for 24 hours because I feel like I got a little less heated. I started thinking about it more. I did ingest some film criticism, and I think I understand a little better what the film is going for, even if I think think that pretense and that premise is kind of foolhardy, to be honest. But anyway, what did you think of Civil War? <laughs> yeah, I liked how we came to the theater and you had this immediate reaction. And I was like, you know what? I think I, I need a little time to sit with this first. I think my exact words were Monkey Man had more to say about society than that movie did. That was your exact quote, <laughs> <laughs> word for word. But when it comes to Civil War, I want to start out by saying that I thought the trailer for this film was absolute trash. Especially looking back on the movie, it is. Yeah, the trailer itself is a little deceiving. It looks like a war epic. And when you actually see the movie, it's a little bit more of a road movie. There's this big sequence at the end of the movie, which has a little bit more of a war effect to it. But I think the trailer just is very misleading and not in a purposeful way. It's just, I think, lazy. it was lazily done, I thought. There was nothing interesting about the trailer at all. I didn't see that trailer and I was like, oh, I want to go see that movie. I saw the trailer and I thought like, oh, is this going to be a 24's first bomb? And after seeing the film... I gotta say, I did judge a book by its cover. I really enjoyed this movie. And I'm excited to talk about it because I feel like we're on two different opposing sides. I don't think it'll break out into a civil war. Maybe if we did this last night, it would have broken out to a civil war. But I have a lot to say about this movie, a lot to examine about the the scenes and stuff like that, breaking down some of these scenes, mm -hmm. which I think are integral to the discussion we're going to have. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting if we view the scenes from the same way and still come down on different sides of the fence, which is interesting because you may be the more politically sensitive of the two of us, interestingly yes, enough. that's correct. It's interesting that you weren't really triggered by this film in the same way that I was. Just to kind of give the the overall of, of why I have an issue with this film. I think for a film that's ostensibly about America's political divide that ultimately leads to factions and civil war, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect an interrogation of those ideas. Frankly, for a film that's as viscerally provocative in its imagery as this one, uh, I felt like it was a film that was just simply afraid to have a point of view. And I'm not even talking about an ideological point of view. I don't want this film to be a political diatribe and just have my politics refracted back at me from this film's perspective. However, this idea that two sides are so thoroughly entrenched in their ideas that they actively dehumanize each other and valorize and militarize their own side, I think gives some fundamental insight into the human condition and societal function that this film just frankly kind of ignores. I didn't expect to say that a Hunger Games sequel is a far more insightful film about revolution than Alex Garland's Civil War, but I actually feel that way. A lot of the discourse or 
around this film is really hung up on both sidesism and that this movie should be more political. I don't think this movie should be more political. I just expected it to have more acute perceptions about the human condition than it actually had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do understand where you're coming from. There are a few things in there that I saw differently. Mm -hmm. I think the film is trying to have a very simplistic conversation and that simplistic thing is just how war is bad. I could understand how that might seem a little bit hollow to other people, but I think it's really a film about how this division can lead to this destruction and what we are is just here to experience the destruction. It doesn't matter what the sides are. The tragedy is in the judgment and the persecution of your neighbor. The tragedy is in the dehumanization and loss of life. It's a reminder how there, there's absolutely no winners in war. And the film is entirely in service of this perspective. And basically what it could look like if this were to happen again in this day and age. See, I agree with you, but one of the reasons violent conflict is horrific is because it's utterly preventable, right? Yeah. And the film doesn't characterize these factions or these characters enough, I think, to garner sympathy at the futility of the violence. I felt like this film was kind of like, I, I said this to you yesterday. No, I didn't. Did I? Maybe I did. But <laughs> I thought it. I felt like this film was was going was like going out to coffee with a friend and they just continually show you memes on their phone and eventually you just want to say like can we have a conversation here? I've seen a lot of films, films that I think are far better made than this one that boil down to war is hell and man is descending into darkness, right? Apocalypse Now is an example that that I think of. And that film tells me what it's thinking through its imagery, which I'm not sure that this film is. Oh, I totally disagree. See, I don't think this film has its symbolic imagery or is telling me distinctly those ideas through its cinematography. Okay, I'm going to get to some of that right now. Okay, but to go. do so, I think requires a little bit more detail. So I would recommend if you haven't seen the film to come back to this review after you've seen it because we're going to get into some detailed information. I'm going to talk about specific scenes because I think that's very important on my understanding how I perceive the film and sure. why I like it so much. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people are saying that the film isn't political enough or doesn't have a side to take or has Which nothing nuanced to say. I want to say, say I don't agree with that. Okay. But anyway, many people are saying that. Okay. But also that you don't think it has much to say about this conflict. I, I agree with that. But I think if you take a closer look at a lot of these scenes and reflect on them, I think there is a lot more there than meets the eye. And it's very subtle things. So this movie plays as like a road movie. And I would say each place is like a stop. So they stop at one place. And one of the first places they stop is a gas station. And so while they're at the gas station, Kaylee Spaney's character, she walks around the back and she sees a couple men that are hung up, strung mm -hmm. up in this barn like structure. One of the other guys with the guns follows her from behind and they're having a little conversation about the men. So the way I see it is that every stop that they go to, there's two opposing sides. Something mm -hmm. is happening. There's a conflict. And in this particular one, we find out that the people that are strung up were caught for looting. And so they caught them, they tied them up and they've been beating them at you know to the edge of their lives. Mm -hmm. And while they're having this conversation, the guy that's with the gun, he's standing there and he's mentioning how that guy I used to go to school with. Mm -hmm. It really made me think about how much dehumanization had to occur to string up a classmate, somebody that you knew, and beat them to the edge of death. But the devil is in the details with this moment because it's the way that Dunst's character asks him if she could take his photo. It's the way he nonchalantly says, where do I stand? He asks her, where do I stand? She's like right in the middle. Like she knows exactly what she's looking for from this moment. And it's the way that the camera itself focuses on the close up of the faces of the men that are being beaten. And you see their eyes are completely disfigured and their faces are all bloody. I think it's very clear from standing outside the scene who is the oppressor in the scenario and who is the oppressed. Is this type of violence really warranted for what those men did. In my mind, I see the guy with the guns and the ones beating these men are the people that are morally in the wrong for this because they've chosen to such a violent act when they didn't have to do that. So the films showing that we have these two sides that are utterly stuck in their points of view without any nuance, but not giving us the nuance of the middle of it. No, I think it's saying something, though, about the two sides in every scenario. And I could keep going on from this. Yeah, no, I know. I, 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 or with what you're saying, and I think what you said is really insightful, I'm applying it to the sequence later in the film in the Winter Wonderland when we were like, oh, I don't know what side he's on. He's just a guy shooting in a house. Yes. Right? And I'm sure that you, this is something that fits into your perception as well, right? Yeah, because there was a quick mention during that sequence that the guy in the house was the one who shot first. Mm -hmm. So they're there just to like try to get him and they don't know who he is. They don't know what side he's on. That little detail, I'm like, why would they put that in there? They're putting it in there for a reason. And I think even in that sequence, you're seeing that these guys didn't ask for this fight. This random person in this house is shooting at them. 
he's at fault. So again, I think there's another sequence, another scene where we're seeing somebody that's an oppressive force versus somebody that's just sort of maybe defending themselves. That's where I feel like this film could have really benefited from more world building. And this is a deliberate choice that they make. I'm acknowledging that. They deliberately don't give us context. So the film brings us through a variety of these, these stage conflicts that you're talking about. In addition to what you were talking about in the Winter Wonderland with the sniper, there's a, a shootout earlier in this multi-level building between two factions, and that's very visceral. It's drenched in smoke and plaster from exploding walls. And we have these freeze frames of the photos that they're taking as they're going through this. It has this really tangible grit about it. But what's missing is, I think, how these men came to be. Like, what in this country motivated these men to kill each other? What are their beliefs? The film missed this crucial opportunity, I think, to investigate the motivations of revolution or the motivations of patriotism. It's the lack of cohesive detail in the world that I feel like I have a lot of distance from. I didn't leave this film with an understanding of the world that they inhabit at all, even as the direction indicates to me that I should be finding it vehemently important. We could talk about it now, we could talk about it later, but there's a scene with Jesse Plemons, a scene which overall I found really intense and very yes, effective. Yeah. Um, there's a mass killing in that scene that's never explained, barely even regarded. Am I supposed to meditate on the savagery of man? Is the soldier's descent into hell and a result of desperate circumstances? Because I show you this film and I raise you so many better films that did this in a more precise way and told me something quite disturbing about human nature that I feel like with this episodic nature of the film, I feel like it's just politely skipping through all of these vague ideas that it, it just doesn't want to explore very much. I feel like, like, like I love, like I maybe, sorry, I just no, you're calm good. down for one I'm second. Ready. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, I love this idea of this town, this beautiful, pristine town where everybody's pretending that the war isn't happening, except for the people with guns on the roof and the people with guns at their borders, right? That's a really interesting idea. And that was something that would definitely happen if there was a civil war in the States again. I felt like we were there for three seconds. We got some odd character development where women try on a dress, wasn't loving that. Then we're just gone. And I, I, I feel like all of these interesting ideas are just being skipped over. I do want to go back to Jesse Plemons scene. I'll address the other scene briefly because I think that shop scene was very interesting, but I don't really make much of it. It's one part of the movie that I probably cut, but the Jesse Plemons scene is one of the most fantastic sequences of this movie because- it's My favorite sequence in the movie. So much of that ideology is sitting right there under the surface. It's the way he's asking the other characters, what kind of American are you? And so where are you from? And notice, who does he kill? He kills the two immigrants. When Kaylee Spaney's character falls into the pit, who is she all on top of? They're all black people. They're all people of color. Mm. He's a racist. So you think the film is has quiet left-wing politics? The thing is, I don't look at it as politics. I'm so sick of all these things becoming political when it's really just the dehumanization of particular groups of people. That's not political to me. Yeah, completely. Then why is this film so interested in extraordinary vagaries? With people that already have these firm beliefs, you can't just go to them and say, yo, you're wrong for this belief. We know people. I know people. Gosh, I know somebody on Twitter that retweeted a video that was calling for the arrest of a trans parent and while they were in jail, calling for them, hoping that they would be murdered. Mm -hmm. This showed up on Twitter. If you're looking at it from an outside perspective, how are you going to get to that person? You're not going to go out to them and tell them that what they did was wrong. They do not give a shit. They think they're in the right. They think they're doing something morally productive because they don't realize that they are on the wrong side. They're on the oppressive side. They're the ones that are trying to tell somebody what to do with their lives. They're the ones that are calling for violence. Each stop that they make has a conversation about an oppressive figure over an oppressed figure. See, I agree with you. I don't think that's in the text of this film at all. I think it is. I, I think don't. it's seeping through all, all these little <laughs> sequences. I really don't. Okay, and so I then feel... why, why make such a choice to have that pit filled with people of color and black people? Why make the choice for when people answered, where are you from, that he shoots the people that are that... not from the United States and are not white? Yes, I know. He likes Colorado. He likes Missouri. I get it. But the fact that they deliberately don't say it, I think is cowardly. They don't, uh, how, I do. But I got that. How do they not need to say it? They're Be, literally showing it in the president who because, is literally- Because it's has frantically misunderstood. For instance, one of my favorite movies is Taxi Driver. We watched that very recently. And you said to me, I don't know if I like that movie because it seems to glorify its hero. When that's been the debate about that film, I think, for ages, and I'm not trying to derail this and say it's about Taxi Driver. Some people's opinion made Taxi Driver dangerous is because you could completely miss the point of that movie mm. or seemingly what the point is and have a conversation about it. This film is using 
all of the buzzwords to get us triggered. It's talking about, you know, it has a name drop of Antifa. It's called Civil War. There are all these allusions to, to various divides in our American culture. Again, I just don't think it has the balls to have a point of view. And that really bothers me. There's one really good scene between Sammy and Lee early in the film. I think it's their first stop. And remember, they're viewing a firefight and they say, oh, if that's still going on, then we're going to go over there in the morning. They have this really reflective conversation about what it means to be a journalist and what they're personally trying to get out of it. That is frankly the character development that I was missing for the entire film. I think this film really missed an opportunity to take thematic heft, character, world building, and theme, and just like tie it all together in an interesting way. And instead takes this middle of the road, almost like cynical disposition. I, I don't know. It, it irked me. I really don't think that's the case here because I think the whole point... I know. Point... It's, it, we're embodying, like, film Twitter right now. This is what's <laughs> this is what's happening on film Twitter. We're having a civil war over civil war. I think the movie is very particular at the beginning of the film to say that the president is a third-term president. The opening sequence itself follows him on the podium trying to figure out the best way to say the words, like his so, speech. So, have you ever seen Fahrenheit 9-11? Yeah. Yeah, it's an echo of the opening of Fahrenheit 9-11 uh, okay. that has George W. Bush doing the same thing, which I think every president in history probably probably rehearses his stuff before he has to go through the nation. But it shows the the falsity of the whole show. Yeah, there's the mention of the Antifa massacre that occurred. And also at the end of the movie, the way that Offerman's character is literally grasping onto the desk as being yanked away from it, it's like his last grasp of power. And so to me, what I could tell from his character is like, that's the only thing he really liked was the power and being a dictator. I do want to say, because we're going to get into all the photojournalistic parts of it, but I think that is what the movie is replicating is the idea of observing and capturing. I think the movie is trying to act as a vehicle as a photojournalist would, and that's why they're the main characters of the movie. I thought about that. I still hate it. <laughs> oh my god. Because gosh. I feel like the one thing that this film is interrogating is the ambiguity of morality and reporting, which I think is really interesting. Like it admirably doesn't valorize or demonize, I think, the reporters, but simply documents their determination, whatever their motivations may be. There are conversations where they talk about the needs to separate yourself emotionally from the subject, to forget a human being is dying in front of you, simply take the picture, and it's up for other people people to ask questions and to make the judgments. It doesn't moralize one way or another, but it asks the question if reporting the atrocity is enough. Is it simply your job to document the events? One of my favorite scenes in the movie is actually the last one when they're about to kill the president and he says, no, 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 wait, give me a quote first. He says, don't kill me. And he's like, that's good. Kill yeah, me. Yeah. You know, that's a really interesting meditation on reporting. There's a lot to go into the specific idea of the morality of reporting and not really the morality of much else going on in the film. Do you think it's possible an intense right winger watches this movie and feels more ingrained in the way that they think and do January 6th part two? I think that's a particular thing the movie is trying to avoid. You're able to take your politics and inform it onto the film because of its vagary could a, You're saying that's what I'm doing right a now. A far right person do the same thing. Yeah, I think you are. The thing is, oh, I keep coming down to this like I'm tired of looking at it as like a political thing because the way I'm viewing the film is not through a political lens, but a human one. No, I so, am too. And that's what kind of irks me about the film. Yeah. But we're like still on different planes. I think it's a great commentary on those types of people. I saw this film and I thought, oh, yeah, there's somebody out there that if somebody looted their store, they would certainly tie them up and beat them to an inch of their life. Mm -hmm. And that person isn't a good person. <laughs> no, I know. And I was asking the question just to ask it. One of the quotes I always idolize in high school is by Oscar Wilde. And he says, art that is not dangerous is not worthy of being called art at all. Mm. The question I asked wasn't so much a point about uh, this film being dangerous. Like I feel like dangerous art for the most part should be talked about in the discourse. I don't want to just like keep repeating myself. I think the film is so intentionally vague that it leaves itself open to those points of view because it refuses to take a point of view. I, I think that's I know. where I disagree is because I think the film is taking a point of view. And it's I just doing it's, it remarkably subtly. I think it's subtle, but I think it's not subtle at the same time. I'm like, why are you just talking about the president who is a dictator? Like they're talking about that pretty overtly. So I don't think it's subtle at all. I actually wanted to pay it a huge compliment that I really like the sound mixing in this film. The sound so, mixing is amazing. So in this film, the violent effects 
are, are mixed rather loud. And you can tell this because the dialogue seems to be at a moderate volume, but the explosions and gunshots are mixed very high. So what I liked about this is it has a very unnerving effect on the viewer. There are some scenes where a sudden gunshot is almost like a jump scare, where you almost feel like you're in the car with them. You're looking for danger around every corner the same yeah. way that they are. It also adds to overall this really snappy brutality in the film. During these loud and violent sequences when the reporters are taking pictures, we get these black and white freeze frames of their shot with silence being thrust into the action. I really like this as a, a directing effect. It has a way in almost in this, this meta textual way of showing the root of reporting, right? So you may see a picture in the paper and say, wow, that's so awful. And that actually comes from a live moment that was filled with danger and violence and all of these horrific things that we won't be thinking about as readers of the New York Times. This is maybe our loudest review to go with our loudest, the loudest movie. We've I was going to say so loud. We have been screaming to these microphones, so I'm going to have to actually turn down the volume on the editing and editing I'm because we're really sorry. All, <laughs> our, all our subscribers. We're usually so nice to each other. It's rare that we disagree this much, actually. Oh, I don't hold it against you, Jeffrey. I hold it against you. Oh, my gosh. Why? I don't oh. at all. Kind of cool to hear a perspective that you don't agree with at all, but you're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense why he thinks that. One of the other things we were talking about, the sound and how the movie was shot and stuff like that. I really loved how the pictures that were taken during the movie were woven into the film, yep. usually immediately after they were shown. But, you know, a picture says a thousand words, as people say. I really thought they did justice to what those photographs looked like and the moments themselves. I think they had a lot to say about the gravity of the situation and what is actually being lost in war. And that ties into the overall purpose of the film itself. Can I ask you, what did you think of the music choices? What did you think of the needle drops? Oh, there were some very interesting ones because some seemed like upbeat. Yes. Like they didn't fit the gravity. They were like, oh, da, 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 da. Yeah, so I actually like this part of the film. Alex Garland is by no means the first person that invented this, but it brings me back to films like Apocalypse Now. I know I mentioned that earlier. Apocalypse Now uses Dance of the Valkyries, so like, dun, 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 dun. The general is blasting this through the helicopters as they're flying in and they're murdering civilians and they're killing masses of mounts of people in Vietnam. I think it's this interesting commentary on how we view violence in media, how it's stylized in this way that's really cool, but is it so cool? Like, what's up with the juxtaposition of hearing a cool song and seeing civilians being murdered? I actually like the music choices. I thought it was one of the more intelligent parts of the film. Also, on the note of how the movie was shot, one of the more stunning sequences, I thought, was when they were driving through the trees on fire and all the embers yes. that were flying around. And that was one of the, the few unironic needle drops, I think, where the song was meant to evoke the emotions you're, you're supposed to be having. Yeah, and I thought the symbolism in that scene was just so well done. It's not like this fires at a distance or where you can separate yourself yourself from it with like a lot of wars that are happening right now. They're not on our doorstep. They're off in other countries. But the flames and the embers are just billowing all around them against the windows. And whether you like it or not, your home is on fire. So I think this is just a very realistic moment of how I sat in the theater and thought about it was just, what have we done? Mm -hmm. Like, how did we end up here? I think the film in a larger sense is really a story about these photojournalists and how they do their job. Kirsten Dunst plays this character that she's there to not pick sides. She's there to take a photo and show it to the world and have them get to decide what yeah. they think about it. So you think this film is basically like a microcosm of the photo? Yeah. Or like a, a representation? I do. Of I think that way. the photo itself is, yeah, a representation for everything that's wrong. I think the film has a very specific intention. I think it's a warning that the divisions of today, if they're not dealt with, I think this could be our possible future. I think it's a warning that's not rendered in some bombastic fashion, reveling in these great visuals of war, but in the intimate and personal nature of photography. And that's one of my favorite things about the film. You think because it's like a blank canvas that we impose our yeah. beliefs and thoughts and practices. And I think those thoughts and beliefs tell you who you are as a moral human being. I don't think Alex Garland is capable of that. Okay, well, <laughs> that's how I saw the movie, and that's what I'm going to take with me. So I think he is completely capable of that. Lots of these details were so specific and intentional that I can't help but pay attention to them. I think he, if he spent too much time on the minutia of the war itself, I think it would have made too convoluted a film. There's this very specific point that Dunst makes relatively early in the film when she says that she did this as a warning to people. Yeah, she talks about how whenever she took photos overseas, she sent them back as a warning like this could happen here. And now she's taking pictures on her home ground. Yeah, and now that it's here, she doesn't really know what her purpose is anymore because she didn't expect this to ever happen. And we see her towards the end of the movie, she's losing her ability to actually take her photographs. She is sitting there shaking outside the gates 
of the White House, and she has to constantly be pulled forward. So because she's lost the ability to do her job in this situation, because this is something she never wanted to capture, I thought it was extremely powerful that at the end of the movie, she was killed in service of saving Kelly Spaney's character because she was a very representation of what was ignored. Her photos and her warning were completely ignored. And the younger girl who replaces her has this new purpose. It's different from Dunst and therefore naturally carries on her character in the progression of the story. She has a different purpose for her photography than Dunst did. The representations of them as people and what they mean to photojournalism, I think, made a bigger point about the movie. He's so evocative in his filmmaking that you can't help but feel it because like you and I, people who are perceptive to like great and tactile and interesting filmmaking are going to feel a certain way about a well-directed sequence. And that's how I felt about when Kirsten Dunst was killed in this film. Yeah, I thought, wow, that's a really effective way to do that. But then as I started asking myself, but why? And then I started thinking about the hero cycle and I started thinking about it's necessary that Paul dies so that Jesus can be propped up. It's necessary that, that Dumbledore dies so that Harry can be propped up, et cetera, et cetera. I just, I didn't see much in it. And also, frankly, I didn't see Kirsten Dunst's motivation to save Kaylee Spenny's character. I thought that the, the that sequence was really intense, and I give him credit for, for going there in a certain way because that is provocative. The thing is, I knew it was coming from the shaking and her going to the White House and everybody following her. It almost felt like we were on this fatalistic doom march to her dying from, like, minute four of this movie. So that's why it had a dull effect on me, I guess. Okay. For me, I was surprised. But I understand where you're coming from. There's too much about this film that I think that's scattershot in both its thematics and its character development and its screenwriting in a lot of these readings of, of single scenes that I just can't get to. I see your perspective, right? And your perspective is built on this, this structure, right? Mm. And it starts here and it goes here and it goes here and it goes here. It has these th this whole realm of assumptions that I'm not saying that you're wrong about, but that the film continually has other details that you're able to work into this structure. I didn't have a structure. Mm. I just kept watching this as as a film that I didn't feel like it really knew what it was doing. I completely disagree. <laughs> I can't wait to see our ratings. <laughs> what else to say? I feel like I've gotten my point across. I think so too. Yeah, I give it a C plus. <laughs> Wait, are we really on to grades? Is that yeah, your yeah, yeah, we're on to grades. I give it a C plus and I don't need to explain further. I feel like I've done <laughs> enough explaining. <laughs> I give this film an A minus. I really love Holy it. Holy yeah. shit. What do you mean that's crazy? Wow, that's Why are you so crazy? Oh my gosh. I think all the details in this movie are pretty clear as to who is a good person, who no, is a bad person. I'm more saying holy S word because I don't think we've ever been that far apart in a grade before. That is very far. Yeah, ahead. that is a movie husband's first. That is very true. That is a movie husband's first. And yeah. you were begging for it. You've been wanting this forever. I have. I've yeah. been wanting us to just disagree more. <laughs> but I also want to be honest to our viewers. And if we end up agreeing with each other, it is what it is. So I'm actually glad that we were able to disagree on this film, even though you should sleep on the floor later. It's, it's pretty it clear from this discussion who is the oppressor. <laughs> who is I'm the, the oppressor. oppressor. You're telling me to sleep on the floor. Who is the one that put that out there? You put that out there. I didn't say that to you. I think that was a great metaphor, actually, for how I saw this film. Great metaphor. You nailed it. Thank you very much for helping me, in my opinion, <laughs> of this movie. Oh, gosh. All right. And that's it for our lively discussion on Civil War. Have you seen Civil War? Let us know in the comments what you thought. As always, thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you next time.